Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well on this. Hopefully, I don't know where you guys are, but kind of sunny day for us here at Dakota College of Botano. Um, I want to welcome everyone who's uh, decided to join us today. We're really excited to do these webinar series with you guys. Uh, we'll get started in a minute or so, um, right about noon. And so, yeah, so just really excited to guys have, to have you here. Um, this is part of our, our specialty crop integrated pest management webinar series where we will, over the next four weeks, we'll go over some um, integrated pest management, especially crop related integrated pest management um, material. So this first week, we're going to talk about um, plants and pests and then soil and how they kind of all really work together. So we're going to do a little introduction on how um, pests affect or how they've been utilized, how they've been treated for plants and crops in the past and how they're done today. And then we're going to talk also a little bit about how pests interact with plants and all the well. And then also talk a little bit about a little introduction to some soil science and pretty much concentrating on how soil plays a role and sometimes um, plays a role in plant health and sometimes like soil nutrition and things like that can be misidentified as a pest issue. And we'll talk about how to identify a nutrient issue versus a pest issue in a better, very general terms. Um, everything we're gonna go over today is gonna be a bit broader. I mean, honestly, I could talk about plant biology, pest biology and soil science, and that could be its own webinar or series on their own. So I'm um, hopefully I can condense it enough so that you guys can be able to understand a bit about what's going on and how it affects your pest and how plant health really does play a huge role in your pest management practices. And we'll also go into today, we'll, uh, we'll, well, if you're not familiar with integrated pest management, I'll describe and we'll do the very beginning introduction to that. And then the next three weeks, uh, next week we will talk about pest identification. So I will, I can't go over every pest that's out there, but I will try to really concentrate on how to identify some very common, um, especially crop in, uh, related pests here in North Dakota and then how to identify them, what damage to look for and things like that. And then the third week, we, um, we will talk about how to monitor and scout. Well, when we get into integrated pest management, we'll talk about how that's a very important step in integrated pest management is knowing proper ways to monitor and scout for pests. And we'll talk about some practices that you can utilize in your own production. And in the very last week, we were going to talk about the actual management practices where I'm going to go through some of the, the probably most common integrated pest uh, most common pest um, found in North Dakota and some innovative ways to manage those pests. And that's going to go back to, so all of this, uh, these webinars and everything, our research here at Dakota College was funded by a specialty crop block grant through the U USDA Agricultural Marketing Service as well, uh, which was awarded to us to the North Dakota Department of Ag. So we'd like to say a thank you to them. And we were able to do, and part of our project is we want and identify, we worked with some producers across the state of North Dakota, especially crop producers. And we first year we tried to identify some common pests that they were seeing and dealing with in their own especially crop production. And then that and then the next following summer growing season, we had those same producers try some in some new innovative ways of utilizing integrated pest management with dealing with those pests. And we had some really great results with some of our pest issues and some new ways um, that have been tried across the state, but we know will actually do work quite well here in North Dakota. So that will kind of we'll get more into that that last week about some of those experimental met pest management practices we utilize, and then also some very common ones that can help out with some of your more common pests, especially crops. And we'll, like I said, we'll get more into that. So hopefully everyone's here. We're a little bit after noon, after, um, uh, noon right now. Uh, so I'll get started in the presentation for today. Uh, hopefully I can fit it all within an hour. There's a lot of material here. I tried to condense it as much as possible. Originally, we were going to do this as a workshop, which would have been an eight hour workshop. So I had to condense the, this webinar down to four hours to try to make it as practical and easy to follow along for everybody. So a lot of material here. And then hopefully I'll have some time at the end for questions. But if you do have a question, um, feel free to ask either by, you know, um, chiming in or maybe even better utilizing the group chat so that we, uh, so there's not a miscommunication thing. So there will be a spot for questions at the end and, I'm, and there will be parts in this presentation. Hopefully I can get some of your guys' interaction as well. 
All right, so we'll get, before I get started, are there any questions about um, webinar series and, and uh, things like that before I get into this from anyone? You might need to unmute yourself. You're all muted right now. No, nope. awesome. Okay, so I'll get started. So like I said, uh, I should introduce myself at the beginning. I apologize. My name is Amy Kohler. I am the Specialty Crop Instructor and Technician here at Dakota College at Botno and the Intramural Center for Horticulture. Uh, so I've been working very closely over the last few years with our Specialty Crop Block Grant and our Integrated Pest Management um, Applied Research we've been doing. So, and I've been teaching about Integrated Pest Management for the last couple of years here at the college. So yeah, today we're going to talk about plants, pests, and soil and how they, are, how they evolve and work with integrated pest management. So the first thing we're gonna talk about today is how do you define a pest? You know, what is a pest? I mean, technically a pest can be any organism, bacteria, fungi, plant, animal, um, that has a negative effect on human health and or economics. And in this case, with it, especially crops, most likely with your food production, your especially crop production. Um, but in reality, a pest really is any type of organism that you don't want around. So, I mean, a pest for one person, uh, something could be a pest for one person, but for another person, maybe not so much. And a really good example would be a dandelion. Um, some people really, really hate dandelions in their yard. So for them, a dandelion would be a pest. Other people really don't care so much. So for me, I like dandelions. I think they're pretty, and as long as they're not taking over all of my grass, I like how their benefits they provide for, you know, pollinators and bumblebees and things like that. And it adds a little color and breaks up the green. So for me, a dandelion isn't really a pest. So when it really comes down to it at the end of the day, a pest is pretty much what Whatever it means to the person who's dealing with that pest. So um, it really comes down, especially crops, it comes down to you as a producer. And that can be as simple as, you know, some individuals across the state have issues with uh, flea beetles. I'm sure um, if you've had uh, experience with flea beetles with your cold crops and things like that, you definitely know what I'm talking about right now. But I also know there are other producers around the state who really don't have to deal with them. So it's not really a pest for them. Um, so like I said, it really does come down to a producer and what they will determine was the pest issue in their production. So now we're going to talk a little bit about pest control and how it's been utilized in the past and how things are changing um, now in the present and how a lot of a lot of type of pest control, not just in agriculture, but um, across the board is being really moved to that integrated pest management. And we'll get into more later about what that actually is. Um, but the biggest thing, the two ways you could probably, philosophies you can break up pest control in general um, would probably be chemical would be chemical pest control or ecological pest control. And so chemical pest control is something, um, I mean, it's kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's the use of chemicals, you know, at large that deal with that pest issue. Um, it's usually a very short-term protection. It's something you apply, you fix it, and you'll have to reapply over the years. Um, and then also, it's also, there are some environmental and health consequences. Um, and I'm not, and the great thing about all integrated pest management, and I'm hoping to let you guys all know this to start out with, is um, I, I'm not saying that organic is better than non-organic, that, you know, ecological or natural control is better than chemical control. Uh, and when we get into integrated pest management, you'll understand that it really, that this type of pest control can be applied to whatever thoughts or philosophies when it comes to dealing with your own pest management. Um, it can be utilized in organic production, it can be utilized in non-organic production, and it can be utilized in sustainable, um, you know, crop production. So it really is a very versatile way of thinking of dealing with pests. So that's just a little side note on that. So back to what we were talking about. So there's chemical control with, you know, there's the pros and goods, goods and bads that come with it. And then the second philosophy of dealing with pests is ecological, um, where you're, it's controlled more on the pest life cycle and the ecology around that pest. Um, and it's more of a control agent. Um, it may actually be more on the organism versus chemical. And so then times chem chemical can be utilized um, in ecological control as well. And then usually with ecological control, it's specific to the pest itself um, and it's and where you're trying to util manipulate some part of that ecosystem with that pest. Um, and it really emphasizes protection from the pest so much as preventative versus dealing with the pest once it's already present. 
So here are some of the general, um, for your information, how pesticides are kind of categorized. Um, when I say pesticides, it could be, in reality, when people talk about pesticides, it's about all biocides. Um, so it could be something is, and when you wanna break those down, you have your insecticides, which deal with insects, your herbicides, which are more of, uh, we're dealing with plant life, um, you know, and not just weedy plants, um, they can be utilized on crops as well. Um, rodent, uh, rodent sides, which would be dealing with your mammal pests more than anything like that. Um, and most of your mammal pests and vegetable and crop production are um, rodents and even in like humans uh, in society and human living quarters and things like that, it's also rodents. That's why they're called rodent sides and most of them are geared towards the rodent family. You have fungicides, which is uh, the type of pesticide that deals with mildews and rusts. Um, arachicides, that's going to be your ticks and mites, because remember they're in a different family than your insects. Um, you know, spiders and things are all within the arachnid um, family. And then the bactericide, which is when you're really dealing with antibiotics to deal with some type of bacterial infection or pest. Um, so going back to the early years of, of chemical pest control, um, it's really only been around for a little over 100 years or so. Um, uh, big, the first, you know, really influence or start of uh, early chemical pest control besides your generals, probably turn of the century more into the early 1920s. And then we'll, we'll, I'll show a graph um, a little bit later about how the use of chemical pesticides has increased over, you know, over the decades. Um, but the first, that first generation of chemical pesticides, the very first ones that came out, this is pre-EPA, um, there wasn't a lot of testing, there was a lot of issues. Um, and it was your kind of their first, um, the society's first attempt at chemical control. Um, and it included usually very heavy metals, um, arsenic, copper, and lead, all things that we all know today could be very toxic to human and agricultural plants as well. Um, and then the other big downside of that first generation of pesticides is um, the downside of a lot of pests and chemical control is the pests developed resistance. So once those pests, so all of this first generation pesticides were used for a few decades, um, there were some negative human and agricultural effects, and then eventually the pests developed that resistance to them. Um, and so there were some improvements that were made that moved on to that second generation of pesticides. So you have your organic, um, and there were more of organic chemicals. So you had organochlorines. Um, these are the pesticides that were used more after World War II, um, and there are still some of them being used in some of your more developing countries where regulations aren't being uh, aren't as stringent as other areas. Um, and then usually they were used through some type of petroleum, oil, things like that. Um, and there was mechanism of actions often unknown. So you weren't really there still wasn't a lot of research building up to utilizing of how they would have if how they would affect the environment and human health and all those things. Um, and then a lot of, one of the issues a lot of these second generation pesticides had was bioaccumulation and biomagnification. And we'll talk about what that actually means. And then they also still had some toxicity to animals and humans and also agricultural plants. Um, and again, of course, with that vicious cycle, eventually pests did develop resistance. And so again, we tried, so human society tried it again and we made smarter, notice with the question mark in parentheses, smarter pesticides. And that was your third and fourth generation of pesticides. The third generation was your carbomates and organophosphates, um, less persistent in the environment, which is awesome. It would break down over time. It wouldn't stay there forever and build up, um, but very potent acutely. Um, they had a lot, nerve toxins were utilized a lot with the third generation. And these guys were more lethal at low dose than your organochlorines from the second generation. And then um, those eventually evolved into the fourth generation pesticides, which is kind of where we're at right now, um, which is your endocrine disputers. So hormonal chaos. These are the pesticides that are really kind of dealing with the reproductive cycle or that life state or sometimes or they really or they really target a critical part of the life cycle of insects. Um, especially, and also some of your uh, herbicides as well. And they're not exactly direct killers. They're not, the other generations of pesticides was you applied it and it killed the insect on contact. Whereas these guys, they kill it over time by disrupting that fourth generation, disrupting that life cycle of whatever that pest is, or it will reduce the reproduction or fertility of that, popu that pest population. So this is a really just really simple uh, good example of how pests are being um, how pesticides were are being utilized in the United States. 
over time going into about the mid 90s. Um, and it's definitely, and we've, we've leveled out a little bit. We're still building up in some areas versus others, but you'll notice that they really did, agricultural and non-agriculture, you can see we've really increased over the years the use for pesticides. Um, and there were some issues with that, and that's going to happen right here. So the biggest thing with our, with the increase of our pesticides, you know, evolution, you can have your beliefs, but microevolution is a thing that happens. So as these pests, you know, evolved over the generation, and since pests have such short lives, they can evolve over a much shorter period than other, you know, types of organisms. Um, so they developed that time, they genetically developed resistance to those pesticides, these chemical technology pesticides. And so um, by, create, by creating resistance, they actually came back stronger and thicker and more of them. Um, so you get these secondary um, um, pest outbreaks. Sometimes it might even be the same pest, but because of one pest building up by resistance, another pest somehow was also an influence as well. Um, and then also you always have those adverse human health effects and environmental effects. Um, from those first, second, and third generations. And also there are a few, and we've gotten better over the years about those effects. We've done more research. We have the EPA in, in effect and things like that. But there are still, if these chemicals and pesticides were not, are not utilized correctly or legally, they still can have very harmful human health effects and environmental effects as well. So resistance in pesticides is probably our biggest thing. And one of the biggest reasons why um, integrated pest management is so important because we're trying to, the really big part of integrated pest management is trying to get away, not completely eliminate chemical pesticide application, but to prevent it to the point where it's a last resort and utilizing other types of preventative measures to prevent the pest. So you do not build up this resistance to pesticides. And on the other side of things is well, there are certain pests out there who have very, very strong resistance to these chemical pesticides that we really don't have a chemical answer today. A really good example, potato leaf bug, and we'll talk about that in our later, later webinars. That's one of the big um, pests we see here in North Dakota is there's not any truly hardcore proven um, reliable chemical pesticide for that potato leaf bug, um, the Colorado potato bug, because they have built up some crazy resistance. And this is a really good example of how, um, if you'll remember that, that diagram we watched before with how we are in agriculture and also around the world, pesticide use has increased, so has the resistance very strongly, especially in the last 30 or to 40 years. Um, insects and mites, you have your plants, diseases, and then even your weeds, because these, all these organisms have such short lifespans and they can, re they can repopulate so fast they build that resistance up almost as fast as we can throw pesticides at them. So in reality, it's just a big vicious circle. I mean, you start with, you have a pest problem and then you use some chemical pesticides and then there's more resistance. So you make, so you get more pest problems. So you use even stronger, more pesticides and then even more resistance builds up. And so you have your pest problems again and then you use even stronger and eventually you can keep making stronger and stronger pesticides. Um, it's not going to end. It's going to be a, this con the continuous vicious circle. So, um, there, and that's why we're here today and over the next month, we're going to discuss ways to get away from that vicious circle to really help utilize integrated pest management in your crop, your specialty crop production. This is, I'm going to go through this stuff really quick because I do want to make sure we have plenty of time to go over the other stuff, but this is kind of some of that information I was talking about. So when I'm talking about acute versus chronic human health effects, um, acute uh, health effects are things that happen with a high dose, um, and but there's a very short-term response, which sometimes doesn't mean it's not any less deadly, but you have a very, usually it's a very short-term high, you know, high response, whereas chronic, like a chronic disease, is something more of a low dose um, uh, where you have long-term exposure to something, even though it may not as may, may not be as uh, detrimental to your health as like an acute dose, or um, you know something much stronger. But over time, these chronic um, exposures, these long-term exposures to chemical pesticides, can cause things such as burst effects, um, sterility, immune, um, distribution of immune immune system depression, things like that. Um, and the neighborhoods downwind of architectural use and farm families. Um, and these can have these chronic effects because there have been research to show from the use of chemical pesticides in large scale application. And then 
you have your environmental effects, and that's your bioconcentration, biomagnification, and bioaccumulation. So bioconcentration means that as, you know, that pesticide moves through a gradient, it builds up. Um, because it's usually very fat soluble. Biomagnification is the movement through the food chain. So as something eats, so and I'll show a video, uh, uh, kind of a diagram how that works. You have your your you know very bottom of the food chain. It eats it, and as it as that next animal eats, the predator eats it and eats it and eats it. That chemical actually builds up into eventually that top part of the food chain has really high levels of whatever that you know detrimental chemical in it. And then bioaccumulation, which is combined effect of chemicals. Um, uh, with the biomagnification and bioconcentration. And a really good example of, of bioaccumulation and biomagnification is the DDT. Um, if you ever want to watch um, a video, there's Silent Spring, things like that. But pretty much DDT was utilized, it was a great way to utilize to deal with um, mosquito populations to help prevent typhus fever and malaria. And it was sprayed very um, thoroughly in public and also commercial and agricultural uses. And they found out over time, it started to build up in the environment. And what it really affected that umbrella species that would really started to cause some really detrimental use, such was the bald eagle. Because what happened is so that, that DDT would get into the water source, the plankton, algae, and things like that would absorb it. Then the, from there, the zooplankton would, have, would eat that plankton and um, just algae, and then the fish would eat that. And so as it built up, that's parts in, through the, the, the food chain, it would build up in, um, in, in the predators to the point where you have the bald eagle at top that had really, really high concentrations of this DD um, chemical. And what it would do is it actually caused their eggs to be very soft. Um, and so they would not hatch or they would have a lot of those issues. And eventually over time, it almost caused the extinction of the bald eagle in North, in North America. Um, some of the older generation here might remember 60s, 70s, things like that. There weren't very many bald eagles around. And then um, they started having stronger stipulations. The EPA got involved with the DDT usage. And we now have, you know, a booming population of bald eagles because of it. So, and it's not even so much the showing that DDT is bad or these chemicals are bad because DDT is starting to be used in other first world countries where malaria and things like that are still an issue. It's just now that we know enough, there's being smart application of that pesticide and prevention, other prevention controls added. So that's chemical pest control and kind of how it's worked out through the, you know, through the environment and through society over the years. Are there any questions about that before I go on? Oh, all right, awesome. Okay, so we'll keep going. So next we have our natural pest control. Um, and that's gonna be broken down to your cultural control, your control by natural enemies, genetic control, and then there's also natural chemical control. And that kind of comes into play with the organic pesticides and things like that that have a, um, a carbon-based uh, component to utilize in uh, dealing with pest issues. And the thing is when you're using natural pest control, uh, you need to really, what's really important is knowing, kind of having a good background or idea of the insect life cycle. Because remember we talked about how those fourth generation insecticides are really dealing with the life cycle of the pest and are, aren't killing on contact so much as trying to interrupt that life cycle, either the fertility, killing the babes, killing the adult larvae. Um, the thing to really know like with most insects, at least with insects pests, and this can also be applied for you know herbicides and plant pests as well. Well, is knowing the multiple stages of that insect and when and trying to figure out a way to affect that insect at its most vulnerable stage. And you'll notice a lot of um, uh, natural pest controls, especially organic pesticides, will attack that pest during the really vulnerable parts of the insect, which is usually the larva or egg stage because they don't have hard skeletons, they don't move very fast, um, or they will attack the adults to make them less fertile to prevent all of this from happening. Um, the downside of that is usually um, if you're affecting some part of the life cycle, you can't just get away with one application of that natural pest control. You have to use multiple so that you're making sure you're hitting, you know, the various stages of life cycle that's happening in, in your environment. So cultural control, um, when we're talking about with importance to natural control, is getting rid of an alternative host. Um, a really good example of if anyone's having issues with that SWD, um, which is the that that type of fruit fly. I can never it's drop something drops like I will get into more about it. 
um, that's having really big issues with like cherries and fruits and things like that. One of the suggested ways with dealing with this pest, it's not true goal, but it's to try to deal, it's try to get rid of that, those alternative hosts. So if you're really trying to get your cherry crop or your strawberry crop going, you might want to get rid of some of the alternative hosts in your environment that can keep that SWD fruit fly, um, you know, around until your late summer crop is happening, which could be your June, getting rid of your wild June berries or any of your wild early spring fruits. So sort of try to save that other crop. So you want to try to, that's, so that's the idea of getting rid of that, um, that alternative host and whenever that pest life cycle is. Another type is controlled by natural enemies. Um, this is the idea of good bugs. Good beneficial bugs are awesome. Um, and parasitic bugs are awesome. So the idea is you have parasitic wasps that will attack the gypsy moth pupae, lay its eggs, and then over time, those pupa eggs will hatch and kill that, you know, kill that gypsy pupa moth before it can reproduce. Um, so, and oh, that's great to know, Brian, you're having issues with the SWD. Um, we are, when we get into some of the pest management stuff, uh, hopefully we'll have some more information for you guys on what they're doing at NDSU. There's been some really great, I don't know if there's any real true answers on how to deal with it yet, but there's some good suggestions coming out of ND, NDSU's extension. They've done some research there, and we'll talk about that um, in later, um, with later webinars. All right, so sorry, back to the controlled by natural enemies. So, so we're using parasitic wasps, um, things like that. And we'll talk about when we get to our management practices, how you can promote these good bugs to deal with that. Um, and so you, it's also important if you have a pest to do your research and figure out um, what is its predator? Where, what, how can you promote some of these good bugs and you know, eliminate something in that food chain? Either you're eliminating its host or you're, you're eliminating its host or you're eliminating, you know, or you're producing or promoting a secondary consumer that will then eat that, um, that pest that you're having. And then last, and then one of the other areas is genetic control. And this can be something along the lines, and some people, I understand there's ways you can breed in genetic control. This is where GMOs come into play, genetically modified species. Um, I'm not going to go one way or the other. I know some people have very strong opinions for or against that, but that's a type of control that is considered a natural control. And this is where you're either genetically modifying or building resistance or through breeding of, you know, your crop through either chemical, over time, through chemical barriers, it could be something breeding, you know, breeding a crop to have more spines or something like that, or physical barriers, something um, you're actually, you know, you're something, some way you're trying to make that crop naturally more resistant to that pest attack. Um, and that's a really good example of that is the introduction of genes into the crop from other species. And that would be transgenic crops, crops or your GMOs. And a good example would be the BT potato, um, which uh, has naturally, has been genetically modified for the potatoes to produce that BT to make them more resistant against some of those other pest issues they have. And then another way is trying to genetically modify the pest itself. So by producing sterile males, or, evolve, or genetically modifying the, um, the genetics of that pest by introducing serial males into the population so that, um, that they won't be able to breed as fastly and they won't be able to breed at all and hopefully and add that into that population, which has been tried with mosquitoes and things like that. And then last but not least is your natural chemical controls, which can be something as well, which usually control something around manipulating that pest hormones or pheromones to disrupt that life cycle. And a really good example is, um, and those are near Fargo and things like that. I know this is something that's starting to get, was before we didn't have Japanese beetles in North Dakota, but they're making their way here. I know I, um, we've, they've had spots and areas where they're trying to contain them in parts of North Dakota. Where I grew up in the state of Michigan, these guys were everywhere and they ate everything. And if you had any type of garden, having one of these, these beetle bags in your backyard was not uncommon. And the way these work is that you buy this bag and it Hatley releases a natural hormone that attracts these Japanese beetles. They crawl down through that yellow tube into the bag and they get trapped. And then you have a huge bag full of thousands of these Japanese beetles you can get rid of. Um, and that was an example of natural chemical control. There you created the, or you recreated that hormone or pheromone to attract the bugs so that they are not an issue anymore. And that brings us into integrated pest management, the real big, big banner of what these whole set webinars are going to be about. 
Um, an integrated pest management, or IPM, is um, as defined as a sustainable approach to managing pests by combining biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools in a way that minimizes economic health and environmental risks. Um, so the idea between integrated pest management is it's an approach of controlling a pest population using multiple methods um, at the same time, which can be a mixture of chemical and ecological. Remember those two theories of philosophies we were talking about before. And the goal, this is really important, the goal of integrated pest management is more of a long-term management. So you're not just trying to fix the problem, you're trying to prevent the problem from ever, ever happening um, to a point where you have the most minimal environmental impact. And that can save you money, time, uh, health, all of those things so that you have the highest, you know, the biggest bang for your buck, the safest for you and your workers, and the most sustainable way of dealing with your pests. So why should we use integrated pest management? Um, a lot of it can be too that, you know, if, if you've been trying, a good example is if you've been doing a way of controlling with a pest and it's just not working, this might be something you want to look at to deal with that. Pesticide resistance, of course, is a big one. Um, you know, this is happening a lot with the chemical pesticides, whereas, um, if you're, whereas if you're trying to prevent the pest in the first place, you don't have to worry so much about the resistance. Um, also, it's getting harder, you know, a lot of these stronger and stronger chemicals, or it's getting harder for the average Joe Schmo to actually access some of these pesticides if you don't want to have to go through all of that registration and training and insurance to deal with those high we, um, potent chemical pesticides. This is one way, another way to go, another route to go. And then of course, there are always health risks associated with um, chemical pesticides for agricultural workers and consumers. And then also um, another downside, we talked about good bugs and beneficial bugs, but with loss of habitat and use of a lot of these chemical non-specific pesticides is that a lot of our natural enemies that our grandparents could rely on in their garden pests to deal with their garden pests are no longer present because of, um, uh, in which has then caused even more or larger populations of the pests themselves since there's no natural enemies to keep them in place. So the kind of four big parts or five things, I, anywhere in, you'll, you, when you read about integrated pest management, it'll be broken into either five or seven different steps. But your biggest thing in this big circle of pest man, integrated pest management is it comes down to monitoring and scouting, identifying the pest issues that you have and knowing the difference between pest issues and nutrient issues and things like that. Um, setting your threshold and action levels, and we'll talk about what those are. And then, um, and then the actual tactics of dealing or the management of those pests, which are usually, and usually it's never just one tactic. Usually to have a truly sustainable pesticide, uh, sorry, pest management uh, uh, system is to mix you know, the mixture of cultural, mechanical, physical, biological, and chemical. Um, management strategies and then evaluation, you know, me keeping track of your pest issues and what you're doing to manage and then what's not working and what is working so that you can each year reevaluate and try something new or change things up so that you have, you know, so it's geared exactly to what your production is. Just the nice little graphic I like that was um, uh, that was released by the Entomology Society of America of kind of how pesticide works. You know, you have your identify and monitor, you have your evaluate, your prevent, your action, your monitoring, and none of these are all just step by step by step. Sometimes they're interchangeable and it's always a cycle because um, you want to identify and monitor what you have, evaluate the issues, and the biggest thing about with integrated pest management is preventative, not it's so much preventing that pest before it even happens so you don't have to utilize those fast acting chemical controls. And this is kind of back to what we talked about cultural, physical, biological, or chemical tactics. This is kind of the, the pyramid of integrated pest management tactics. And as you get, and it kind of gives you the level of where you should start out with, with what's your last resort. And that kind of fits right into the toxicity or potential for toxicity or health issues or um, either, you know, human or environmental, and then also the amount of work or involvement it's going to take. So cultural is something as simple as your plant selection, overseeding, fertility, 
pH pretty much it's the idea that a happy healthy plant can fight off you know it's going to be a lot better at fighting off pest issues and dealing with pest issues than a plant that's not healthy that's not you know not in our, that does not have the nutrients it needs or maybe it's stressed through water or environment and things like that uh, some things you can do to prevent and then the next step would be your physical and mechanical that can be as simple as you know hand weeding something physically you're doing to remove that pest um, um, you know, setting up some kind of physical or mechanical barrier from the pests, like using, you know, um, you know, bug nets or um, things like that over your crop to prevent, you know, the pests from getting there. Then you have your biological control, which is, you know, utilizing good bugs, something like that, uh, predators, parasites, disease of pests. Um, some there are fungi, organic pesticides out there where, you know, it's a fungicide, you actually introduce a fungicide to the environment that will then prey on your pest. Um, and you know and, and deal with it and then your last resort should be that where you have nothing else to do you've tried everything else and you just need to deal with this pest issue you're going to lose money and there's nothing wrong with that is your chemical and it could be it could be inorganic or organic because I will say this right now just because a pesticide is an organic pesticide does not mean it has high levels of toxicity or human or environmental effects. Um, a lot of them can be quite toxic actually. So they still, when you're getting into those, it still should be a last resort as you've tried to do all the preventive measures you can, because hopefully if you are doing these other three here, when you get to this level, it hopefully it's not even that as bad as it would have been without doing the first couple of steps of preventative measures. And we'll get more into later in the webinar series um, when we talk about management practices, how we can utilize these different tactics in dealing with specific pests found in North Dakota. So, um, like I said before, with integrated pest management, um, it's not, the goal isn't to eradicate the pest completely, because I hate to say it, unless you want to kill everything there, um, and even with chemical pesticides, it's not always a possibility. Um, and it's going to spend a lot more time, energy, and money. It's more along the lines of managing those pests below your economic threshold, which pretty much means you're trying to keep the pests down to a level where it's not really, it's their presence, but they're not really affecting you economically. You know, you might have some aphids on your lettuce, but they're not really getting rid of, or they're not really killing or destroying um, a large amount of your crop that if you were to address that issue would cost you more energy time than the, the few plants you might lose at the end of the day. And that's where we get down to your threshold and action levels. And making that decision of where you're going to allow that pest population or that pest presence to get to stay at a certain level before you're actually going to take action to deal with it is on a producer by producer base. Everyone needs to make, every producer needs to make that decision for themselves. And the idea is that these action levels or threshold levels are what growers put in place to really help avoid risks with their, especially their high value crops. And the idea is that you monitor the pests and the pest levels to the point that once they reach that threshold level, you want to prevent them from going over it because once they reach it and they go past that threshold level, um, that's when you're going to have, you know, where you're going, you're not, you're no longer going to be okay with your part, that crop loss. Um, you're, you know, maybe, and that's going to all be decided and we'll talk about how you decide what those thresholds are for you. And so when you're creating these thresholds for yourself, they should be quantitative and grower driven. So a really good example, um, you know, it, sh it might be you have a crop that say you have your lettuce and you have an aphid problem on your lettuce. Um, and maybe for you, it's like, okay, I'm okay with losing 5% of my crop. Once I start noticing I've lost, I'm hitting that around that 5% of my crop damage or losing that crop, that's when I know I need to do something. And then you need to decide how you're going to determine what 5% is. Is it how many plants you lose? Is it the um, infestation of aphids? Are you going more along the lines? Are you looking at my threshold is having, you know, a population of 20 aphids per plant. If I have more than 20 aphids per plant, then that means I need to do something pretty quickly. Um, and then also, and it could be also be the number of plants to lot, you know, how many pests, so maybe it's a shake, or maybe it's how many you count off the plant, or maybe if you're counting how many leaves are being affected on a plant. Those are all things you need to decide for yourself, and we'll go through how to do that when we get into the monitoring and scouting side of things. And so this is a really good example of how that threshold works. So you have your pest density here, and then, um, and then here you have over time. So over time, of course, your pest, you know, your pest population is going to go up. 
And so here you have your average density. This is the where you're okay. If you are, if your pests, you know, populations around this area, you're really not going to lose a large amount of your crop. Or it's a crop where if you lose a decent amount or even a quarter of it, it's not going to really affect you, your bottom line dollar. And that's the idea that, you know, you might have a much lower threshold for high value crops where you are not willing to lose even one part of that crop versus some of your less valued crops. Yeah, I could lose, you know, if you're tomatoes and you're, you sell a lot of tomatoes and have a lot of tomatoes, maybe you're okay with losing, you know, 10% of your crop. Because at the end of the day, the amount of time and energy it's going to take you to, uh, to try to control that pest issue, it's going to cost you more, um, you know, than what you would have lost over, you know, from the actual crop production. And so then you have your economic threshold here. So once that pest population starts getting close to that economic threshold, that's when you know you need to start applying controls to prevent it be hitting your economic, exceeding economic injury level. So this here, that's where you know you're gonna lose money. So you wanna try to control or you're not gonna be able to handle it or it's going to affect you at the end of the day of how much you're going to produce or how much you're gonna make off that crop. So from here to here is where you're applying those controls, where that population and this and deciding pest density or effect and all that, that's all on you to decide as a producer. So um, hopefully you can kind of get the idea of where, how you would set an economic threshold for yourself. Um, and then you need to always remember when you're setting your economic threshold is um, it's probably going to vary depending on the crop. That's the whole idea of difference between, you know, high value crop versus a low value crop. You might be more forgiving. Um, a really good example is back, say you have, um, it could be even for the same pest. So say you have bacterial leaf spot on your poinsettias. Poinsettias are a very high value crop. It's a very short period that if you even lose, you know, if a producer even lost 5% of their poinsettias, it could be absolutely devastating to their, you know, their end game of their economics they're going to gain economically. But maybe you also produce tomatoes in your greenhouse and you produce a lot of tomatoes and it's really cheap and it's very, and it's not a lot of managed labor intensive like poinsettias are. So if you had bacterial leaf spot on your tomatoes, maybe you're okay with losing, you know, 20% or even 30% because the end of the day, you know, you, you, you don't sell the tomatoes for a lot and you produce a lot of it and it doesn't cost you near as much and like in prep and man labor and all that kind of stuff to deal with it, that you're, you're okay with losing a small portion. So you're not going to concentrate so hard or you're going to allow that, you know, you're going to try to use just utilize preventative measures from keeping it from spreading. And then also um, insects and diseases on ornamental crops and nurseries or also on your vegetables and things like that. You know, you never know. It just really depends on what the crop is and what you're willing to lose and also you know it's it's really specific from producer to producer and it can be specific from you know from crop to crop as well so any questions about integrated pest management and how pesticides are being utilized today um and like i said the, the actual how the the tactics uh, that you can use for management and then you know the threshold and monitoring and scouting to identify these pests will all go over the next week few weeks um, but next I want to talk a little bit about um, soil health and how nutrition and plant health really does play effect um, on your pest issues and then also how to um, identify a soil nutrition problem versus a pest issue or if, problem. And that will build right into next week, which is where we will actually look at identifying pests and pest issues. So before I get into soils, are there any questions about economic thresholds or um, pesticides through the ages or anything like that? Okay, awesome. And like I said, just before um, I get into this, um, if you do see like you have more questions, um, I'll have my information, contact information at the end of the slides. Um, and so I'm always here, uh, me, and we have Keith Knudsen and other, you know, some of our other staff here at Dakota College at Botno, who are always available to help answer your questions on integrated pest management, nutrition, all of those things. Um, and we're, we, we love, you know, to talk to you guys and help you out where we can, providing technical assistance. So we're going to talk about intro to soils and effects on plant health and growth. So first, we're going to do a little bit of background on what soil actually is. So what is soil? Um, the biggest thing is it provides air, water, and nutrients to plants. And we'll get into a little bit more a little bit later of what exactly it provides from what plants need. Um, also, soil provides mechanical support for plants, um, which is really important as well. And again, what is soil? It can, usually soil is consisting of weathered materials, decaying organic matter, 
air, and then water. So the weathered materials, that's your, your minerals, your broken down rocks, decaying organic matter, anything that's carbon-based, plants, animal organisms, all that stuff that's breaking down. And the last two people don't realize and how important they are to plant health is air and water. Um, you know, you need soil with air and water and it is a big component of what soil is. So defined, um, soil is a mineral and organic material that supports plant growth on Earth's surface. And it's a mixture of rock, organic material, living forms, air, and water. And then, you know, just your general soil, you have your topsoil, that's where you're going to have most of your bacteria, your organic matter, fungi, insects, earthworms, roots, all the things plants really, really want and need, especially when you're working with specialty crops. You really only need to be worrying about that topsoil layer. Now, if you're looking at trees and ornamentals or maybe something along those lines, then you might want to worry about subsoil. And then below that, you have your parent material. That's your hard, you know, it might be your water source, your limestone bedrock. That's your mineral source or substance part of the soil itself. Um, so what, so what are the soil resources that help support life? Um, biggest thing, oxygen, of course. Um, oxygen is really important for adequate root, ad adequate, uh, root growth. Not only do plants need, you know, humans need oxygen in the air, plants need more, actually need more oxygen in the soil than anything else. Roots need oxygen. We know they take in carbon dioxide and they spew out oxygen themselves, but you still need to have soil that air is still able to flow through because those roots need that oxygen to, um, to grow and, and regenerate. It's like compact soil or really fine where there's not a lot of porous open space can really affect plants health and, and its growth overall. And then of course temperature. Soil needs to be a certain temperature. It gets that heat from the sun and it loses that heat to the atmosphere. Um, you need to have a certain temperature for plants to do well and the, um, each species of plant has, has more has a temperature of soil that they tend to do better than others. Um, and then of course water. Water is important to all living things. And hopefully we all know that you know you need to have some moisture in that soil and that's you know and the, the plant is stressed through drought conditions that's going to make that plant more susceptible to pest issues. Um, and then of course carbon, that organic matter. Um, if you have straight sand in your soil and you don't really have a lot of organic matter built up in it, um, your plant may probably is going to have some nutrition deficiencies or something along that lines, um, in, especially if you're not applying a lot of uh, chemical fertilizers and things like that. So having, and then also the great thing about organic matter is they also, it also helps promote oxygen and water as well. Organic matter is nice, big, and porous, so it can create air pockets and areas to absorb that moisture um, in the soil, which can help um, add to the oxygenation and water holding capacity of your soil. And then of course, last but not least, is your nutrients. That's the stuff that the plants need to take up and utilize to grow. It's the basis, with their photosynthesis, it's the next part of their basis of their substance. And if the plant's having nutrition deficiencies, it's going to be a lot more susceptible or it's not gonna be able to fight off a pest issue nearly as fast as if it's just happy and healthy. And that's where it just comes down to, ladies and gentlemen, is that a happy, a happy healthy, a happy plant is a healthy plant. The, the more you can, um, you can fix or create an environment that that plant is the happiest and healthiest it can be, the, more, the better able that plant is going to be able to deal with pest issues on even at just its own. So soil in general, you have your mineral, organic, air, and water. Um, and then, and of course, and that, that's broken down usual percentage. So these percentages are what you really want to look for in a good soil. You want at least about 45% of the soil should be mineral matter, um, which is your partially composed rock, sand, silt, clay. About 5% of soil, um, you know, in general is your organic matter. You need about 25% of that soil to be air. That's going to be those open pockets where water and air can move. And then another, the last 25% should be water. And this is kind of a good example. You have your minerals, your air, your organic matter, and then you also your water as well. So living organisms in the soil. Um, these things are really important as well because you're not going to have great organic matter and things like that if you don't have some life. That's what people talk about about life in soil and these. And so there are in earthworms, insects, bacteria, all that stuff helps break down that soil. So you want to make sure you have a very healthy uh, living soil to help provide those nutrients and um, the aspects that the soil plants need from that soil. And like I said, I could go into really deep detail about bringing life to the soil and adding to it and making amendments. 
and all of that stuff. And I just, we just don't have time today. Um, but there are a lot of great resources and how you can, um, you know, work with the soil that you have to amend it, to add what it needs, um, to keep, you know, to how to know if you have a healthier, happier living soil. Um, and we can always help you out here as well. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about that just because we just don't have time during these webinar series to go into that. Because literally I could do a four, I could do a four-day webinar series just on soil by itself. It is a very important part of specialty crop production. This is just an example of um, sand versus your sandy loam and clay, your kind of main, usually soil is made up of one of three things, sand, um, loam, and clay. And when the loam is kind of that mixture in there. Um, and so you kind of want that happy in between loam because you'll notice you have great water permeability, you have open sp pore space and it allows areas for organic matter and things like that. So here comes the really important part. Um, what are the growth factors? What is it that plants need to grow? Well, they need light, water, nutrients, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and temperature. And a lot of this stuff they get from the soil they're in. Uh, I mean, besides maybe the light, and the carbon dioxide, even the soil can have carbon dioxide. The other four, they can get, the plants can utilize and need from their soil. And so what we're gonna talk about is nutrients. Nutrients are really important. And really the only place a plant is going to get its nutrients from are the soil. And it really plays a full role in the health and um, the lung, the, the able to fight and deal with things and stress levels comes down to nutrients. Cause it's something that we have a lot harder way to control for our plant's environment. So something to know about soil fertility, there are 17 known elements that are essential to plant growth. Um, and those are broken down to your macronutrients and your micronutrients. Um, so plants require nutrients that are not created through photosynthesis. So you have your, your hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon, those all they get through air and water. But um, the ones they actually need through the soil are the macro and micro. So your macronutrients um, aren't, and none of these elements, not one is more important than the other. Um, it's just that the macronutrients they need really high amounts of compared to the micronutrients. And usually your macronutrients tend to leach through the environment, don't last in the soil for very long, or used much faster in the soil. Um, so if anyone's ever bought, um, you know, a chemical fertilizer or fertilizer in general, you'll usually see that MPK, nitrogen, um, phosphorus and potassium. The reason why most, you know, general commercial fertilizers have these three in there is because these, out of all of the nutrients that plants need, these they need the highest amount. And also, especially with like your nitrogen, they just don't stay in the soil very long. Um, they leach through through rain, movement, um, you know, you know, pH, all of that plays a big role with these, and they're the ones plants need the most of. And those are the ones we're going to look at um, today about nutrient deficiencies. There are ways to recognize deficiencies for your micronutrients and things like that, but like I said, we just don't have time to go through all of them. But I'm going to at least get through and show you what your big three are to look for to know that it's a nutrient deficiency and not a pest issue. Um, so plant nutrients, of course, can be added through the soil through commercial fertilizer and manure, compost, all ways to utilize depending on what your growing methods are. Um, you need to know the amounts to apply and you need to soil test. I can't express even more. You won't really know for sure you have nutrition deficiency sometimes because some nutrition deficiencies can look a lot like a pest issue or a disease issue or something like that. And if you really want to know if you have nutrition deficiencies, get your soil tested. Because that's going to tell you right off where you're, you're working out with. And I'll talk about later how you can do that and where you can go to get those tests. And then also sometimes on the other hand is either you may not have too little of a nutrient, but sometimes having too much of a nutrient can cause um, issues in poor, uh, such as poor plant growth and or death. Just like water for humans, you know, water is something we need, but you can literally kill yourself from drinking too much water. There's always such a thing as to want too much of a good thing. So that's always something to remember as well, is you don't want to be burning or piling on a ton of fertilizer that you don't need, and you really won't know for sure what you don't and do need if you don't do the soil test. So this is where I'll get into the last part, um, last eight minutes or so. It's just some of the really common, the three common nutrient deficiencies you're going to see in your crops. So the first one, the big one, nitrogen. Um, I mean, nitrogen is really important in crop, uh, especially crop growth and health. A lot of our um, high, pro, high producing um, crops really need a lot of nitrogen to produce. Um, and nitrogen is one of those things that does not stay in the soil for very long. Um, it leaches through really quickly, especially if you're applying it in a chemical form. 
um, and plants need a ton of it. Um, so most of the uh, nitrogen though is from organic matter. Um, it promotes growth and color. And then it can actually, it's one of those ones that if you have too much, it can cause issues like excessive growth, weak skins, or even burn. Um, so it's something you don't wanna to have too much of either. So when you're looking at nitrogen deficiency, um, these are really good uh, examples. So you're gonna see dwarfed growth or really thin growth. And then overall, the plant is gonna be really light green in color and then turning yellow in later in the season. So this is a tomato plant here. This is probably a healthy tomato plant. And then this is one that is, uh, has a nitrogen deficiency. So overall, it's, you know, you'll notice the whole plant as a whole has a lightning color. It's not on the edges or the sides. It's almost the whole thing is lightening up. And this is an example of nitrogen deficiency over time in, a, um, in lettuce. And you'll see it gets that yellowy color, the lettuce is getting smaller, the leaf's getting smaller, um, and where it almost loses that, that, that green color over time. Um, next, we're going to talk about phosphorus, that, that P and the NPK. Um, the primary source the plants are going to get the phosphorus for will be specific metals, uh, sorry, minerals, and then also organic matter can have phosphorus as well. Um, phosphorus promotes seed development, reproduction, and cell division in a plant, and it also enhances root development and water uptake by the roots. So you can have, they're much, plants much more efficient at taking up water and growing roots. And then also if, um, if it has too much phosphorus, it can actually, um, actually lead into deficiencies of other nutrients. So if your soil has too much phosphorus, it can actually, things like calcium and things, other minerals like that, it can actually prevent the plant from being able to use those and cause deficiencies in those other types of nutrients that the plant needs just as much as the phosphorus. So when you're looking at nutrient deficiencies for phosphorus, um, your very first symptoms are gonna be a downward curling of the leaf. This is again, another tomato plant. Um, and then you're going to see some intervenials right around the veins of that, of the, you know, the veins of the leaf. You're going to see uh, that tissue is going to become paler green and eventually die. So you're going to see more of a, uh, a paler green along the veins um, working out. Whereas with the nitrogen deficiency, the whole plant really slowly starts to fade into a lighter green. Um, and then you might even see like this one here is some scorch on the older leaves. So the edges and things like that, the marginal, the edge of those leaves, the margin of those leaves will start to scorch and look fried, almost like a sunburn. And then last but not least, we have potassium. Um, its source um, is minerals. Um, you're not going to get a lot of potassium from organic matter, though it, um, so it's definitely a, a mineral-based um, nutrient. It increases winter hardiness. It can also reduce diseases uh, because it's something they use to help fight that. And then it's important, really important in ripening fruits and vegetables, especially. Um, potassium plays a really big role. So a lot of, for especially crop producers, that's us. So potassium is something you should always think about in making sure you have enough of it in your, your soil. So when you're looking at a potassium deficiency, um, the leaves are going to be smaller. Uh, sometimes they'll get more of a darker olive green and have a really dull appearance, especially if it's a plant that has more of a shinier leaf. Um, they also have a tendency to cause leaf curl downward, um, and then the leaf petioles um, will become a darker, maybe a darker red, and that's going to be something along here, right where the leaf attaches, the petioles. And then sometimes you'll find brown spots um, along the veins of the leaf, and then also on the underside of the leaves can also be potassium. And this is one of the ones where, especially with potassium, it could also be, you know, some of the symptoms are very similar to certain pest, fungi, and bacterial symptoms. Um, so it's, it, it can sometimes come down to when you're trying to decide what you have going wrong with your plants is you might need to do a mixture of a soil test and or um, try a couple different things because it can be mistaken a lot for pests and vice versa. Pests can be mistaken for potassium deficiencies as well. Um, but it's, it's definitely something to look for when you're looking at what is what issue you're having as a nutrition, nutritional or is it some kind of pest issue. So last we're going to talk about is pH. pH plays a huge role in plant health. Um, and here in North Dakota, as most of you know, we have very, most of the plate, most around the state, we have very alkaline soil. And it does affect a lot of the health and the, the resistance of pests that plants have. And it can really affect plant growth and nutrient availability. Not only can it affect the growth of the plant, it's going to, and how it grows, but it's going to affect the availability of the nutrients in that soil the plant can utilize. Um, so different plants also have different soil pH requirements, and that's something to know as well. Um, and there are ways of adjusting soil pH through soil amendments. So this is just an example of the pH range. Here in North Dakota, I have seen soils as high as almost 9 
percent. So really, really on the base on the, the basic side. Um, you know, so we're more along the arid regions. We get those higher pHs. Um, and then here's an example. Remember all those macro and uh, micro and macronutrients we were talking about? You know, this is just kind of showing how readily available these nutrients are to your plants, depending on your pH. So phosphorus is a really good example. If you have a really high pH around between 8 and 8.5 in your soil, you're going to have probably a lot more issues with phosphorus deficiency versus if your soil is more neutral, um, you know, more neutral on the lines. Potassium, not so bad. Calcium, not so bad. Boron is an issue, you know, if you have that higher pH. Um, so it's just something to kind of understand that uh, pH play, all plays a uh, plays a role in what, how your nutrients are available to the plant. And then also certain plants really do like certain types of pHs. Uh, so in reality, potato growers, P, uh, potatoes prefer more of 5.5 and 5 in plants. It's optimal. It doesn't mean these plants won't grow and outside of their optimal growth, but you're, there's a reason potatoes just tend to do better in acidic soil. But you can still produce them quite well, but they're going to be able to fight off disease a lot better in acidic soil probably than more of our basic soil. And so it's just an example of some very common specialty crops that, um, and it shows kind of the range of pH these plants are going to like growing or do the best in. Um, you know, tomatoes, you know, they really don't like much over neutral. So when we have really highly basic 8, 7.5, 8.5 um, soils, you know, they might be a little more, um, you know, more, they're going to be more susceptible to disease because they're going to be more stressed out and less nutrient availability. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about your pH of your soil. And you should have an understanding of what the pH in your soil is. So at the end of the day, um, your best bet when it comes to soil is to do a soil test um, because you're really not going to know what kind of nutrient deficiencies you might have or you might have or, you know, excess organic material, um, pH, all of that can be figured out by a simple soil test. Um, and, a great, and a great location you can go through um, if you're in North Dakota, NDUSU and North Dakota State University um, soil testing lab, I have the link here. Um, if you'd like to, and you really just Google NDSU soil testing lab and the toil test can range anywhere from $22, which is your simple NPK, um, you know, organic matter, salt levels, uh, pH levels, all the way up to a complete analysis for, for $70, which is, you know, not only it has your cation exchange, it's having your charge of your soil, a lot more in depth, but you kind of have to know also what you're looking for. And the great thing about NDSU Soil Testing Lab is they also, when they do your soil test, they do some, um, when they get your results back, a lot of times they'll also give some suggestions on how you can amend that soil. So your best bet, like I said, do that soil test, figure out where you need nutrients and don't, and then add those amendments, um, those changes and things you can add to the soil to bring it to the most optimal um, performance so that your plant is as healthy as it could possibly be, because it's just that is really your first step in preventing pests and integrated pest management is keeping those plants healthy and happy. Um, so if you'd like some more information about soil health or um, amendment, amendment suggestions, you know, you can always contact me, Amy Poehler. Um, I've got my phone number here and then also my email. Uh, and so, and then also you can always, and we have Keith Knudsen here. And then also we, if you uh, are on Facebook, we have the East Interim Center of Horticulture Facebook page and also the DCB Horticulture page as well, um, which I have access and some of my other staff here have access to, and we always love ask, answering questions. So. Um, I guess what I'm going to do now, um, I know we're a little bit over and I, and I appreciate everyone for, for joining us. Um, so uh, if anyone does have any questions, I'll stay on for the next five or 10 minutes um, to answer any of them. But if not, I really do want to thank everyone for their attendance today and I hope to see everyone again on Tuesday. Um, and again, next week we will be talking about pest, um, pest identification, what, to look, what pests are you looking at and some of the signs and symptoms to look for in your, in your specialty crops. So again, I'll open this up for any questions. Okay, it doesn't seem like we have any questions. That's, that's perfectly fine. I guess that means I must have just been really good at explaining everything. Um, so like I said, you can always contact me here. 
And then uh, the, you'll be using the same link uh, next week to join. And then again, they're posted on Facebook and also, see also their email sent out. And I hope to see everybody again next week. Bye, guys.